Good morning, everyone. Hi, welcome to the Atlantic Council. I'm Damon Wilson. I'm our Executive Vice President for Programs and Strategy here at the Council. I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's uh, debate, today's conference uh, on the illiberal turn, question mark, reasserting democratic values in Central and Eastern Europe. I want to start just by uh, kicking off and saying thank you to all of those who have joined in a really dynamic partnership that's helped put this uh, uh, effort together, um, some of the most dynamic uh, leading organizations in the transatlantic space. An enormous thank you to Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, the International Republican Institute, and the Center for International Private Enterprise for your partnership, and to the National Democratic Institute for their cooperation in this effort. The idea for this conference grew out of a realization that our communities were asking many of the same, same questions. Is history returning to Central and Eastern Europe? Did, did we overestimate the ability of post-communist societies uh, to sustain their transitions? Is Russian propaganda undermining the achievements of the European project? How do you reconcile populist, nationalist politicians with an integrated democratic European future? And has the United States lost ground and credibil credibility in promoting democratic values in the region? So for me, this, this discussion today is very personal. Um, my introduction to foreign policy and geopolitics was through the eyes of a first grader and my best friend who was the son of a dissident who escaped from Romania, Ceausescu's Romania. This region more than any other animated my imagination, my worldview, and my career. And so this is the conversation today, as many of you know, is embedded in a sense of history. This is a region that so often had its future determined by outsiders. It's witnessed enormous tragedies. In the wake of World War I, so many in the region achieved self-determination, but only to see democracy and sovereignty eroded in the interwar period. In the wake of World War II, what was victory in many of the world's eyes opened a new chapter in, in this region of communist repression, Soviet domination. And again, we saw democracy snuffed out as meticulously documented uh, by Anne Applebaum in her book, The Iron Curtain. So I felt very privileged in my own small way to play just a modest role in the latest chapter that we've experienced in the region since 1989. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union has led to a remarkable transformation, the restoration of democracy and independence and sovereignty among many of these nations. And we've, today I think we're reminding ourselves that this region and the results that we've seen produced, it's embedded in NATO, embedded in the European Union that these were processes that actually were driven by the demands of the people in the region themselves. Despite the false narrative that we often hear today, um, this was not about Western policy to provoke Russia, as many like to argue today. Rather, it was frankly our belated response to the aspirations of the region really knocking and pushing, which led to the formulation of a Europe whole, free, and at peace as both a vision and a strategy. And the region went then from being an object of transatlantic strategy to playing a role in shaping transatlantic strategy to now there are some questions being asked of concern. So today we're going to focus on Central and Eastern Europe. There's a, p a particular history, and we are, committed, we are committed not to see the repetition of some of this history. Yet my belief is that the challenges that we're seeing in the region today we have to recognize a couple of things as background of the conversation. There are concerted strategy right now by authoritarian regimes, particularly in this region from Moscow, to roll back the gains of the last 25 years. This is a message that our Eurasia Center, which is helping to organize today, has been trying to bring home clearly in its work. But second, we're vulnerable in part because we're facing challenges all across the democracies of the world, of the globe. Look at the United States. Look at what's happening all across Europe with populace, crisis and a, and a confidence of, of what we represent, what we believe. And I think the corollary of that is that if we go wobbly as a core community, if fragmentation begins to happen in the core, it has an outsized impact in the periphery. It's why at the Atlantic Council we've been focused on the Balkans, on Europe's east, because it's a particular time of vulnerability. But today we come back to Central and Eastern Europe, and we do so because its trials, its successes, are such a source of inspiration. The shared history in the region of overcoming authoritarianism and embracing democracy and open economies underscores the transformative power of Euro-Atlantic cooperation when we work together at it. This is also against the backdrop of our own programming that's been celebrating this year, the legacy of Václav Havel and his 80th anniversary of his birth. 
It's part of the Atlantic Council's commitment to future Europe and what we call our Future Europe Initiative that's premised on the idea that we're witnessing a historic evolution take place right now in Europe and that the United States is invested in this outcome and we need to be active in helping to shape that future. So all of you are here today and all of you who are watching online, we're here to work through a couple of things today. How to understand the dynamics and recognize what's happening in the region. How to build a community that's committed to the ideals uh, that have helped transform this region for the better over the past 25 years. But most importantly, what are the strategy solutions? How do we join together to fight for our values and our interests? Uh, because we believe here that we are stronger with allies. Uh, so today's conversation will get into all of this. I encourage all of you into the room and watching online to join the conversation by using the hashtag DEM values, democratic values, hashtag DEM values. To introduce our con discussion and set the scene, I'm really pleased to welcome a good friend, the Honorable Tom Melia, Assistant Administrator for Europe and, uh, Europe and Eurasia at the US, uh, USAID. Thank you for being with us, Tom, today. Uh, Mr. Mealy is responsible for a half billion dollar assistance portfolio and oversees efforts of USAID missions and development programs in 11 countries as well as several regional programs. He's been a frequent traveler to Central and Eastern Europe serving on the ground for the United States and helping new democracies further embed themselves in the broader security and stability of the transatlantic community. Uh, his expertise on Europe is informed by a deep knowledge of the region. He comes to his current job after having served as Executive Director of Democracy International, as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor from 2010 to 2015. Uh, and he also previously served as the Deputy Executive Director of Freedom House, and Vice President of the National Democratic Institute. Uh, without further ado, let me welcome Tom to the stage to set the scene. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Damon, and thanks to the Atlantic Council for convening this important discussion today. Thanks also to the co-sponsors, IRI, SIPE, RFE, RL, who, made, who are making this symposium possible today. The fact that everyone in this room knows exactly what and who I'm talking about when I say IRI, SIPE, and RFE, RL just confirms that this is, in fact, a room full of Washington insiders card-carrying members of the internationalist elite, policymakers who talk their own language, or maybe our own language. Um, and it reminds me of the rule of three in Washington acronym speak, uh, which is that if there's only two words in an organization's name, uh, then you can use the two words. But if there become three words, then you have to immediately go to acronyms. Look at the difference between the department, look at the difference between State Department and Department of Defense. We always go straight to DOD, and we all know what that means. Uh, there's the NSC, NSA, DOE, and of course the uh, ABCs, the annual bilateral consultations that our government launches with so many countries around the world. And I say this to remind us of what has become painfully obvious, that there is a striking and widening chasm between those of us who live in world capitals, carry gold cards for more than one airline, and believe in the possibility of an inclusive world order governed by law and justice and liberal values of civil liberties and rule of law on the one hand, and those of our compatriots in the US as well as in Europe who are honestly afraid of this prospect. And I think it's because we have not done a good enough job explaining what it is that we mean about this uh, international global order based on law and based on values so that it would make sense to enough of our compatriots. Uh, I think we've gotten lazy at that in our domestic politics and in our explanations of our foreign policy. And we're seeing some of the consequences of that today, uh, not only in the United States, but in kindred democracies in Central and Eastern Europe. Our challenge in a democracy is that we have to make the case to our fellow citizens about what is good policy and what are the benefits of internationalism, of globalism, of free trade, of uh, open borders where people can come and go and live their lives freely and seek prosperity and justice. This is only gonna get more difficult in the period ahead, regardless of the outcome of our presidential elections and the results of others coming in Europe. The forces of nativism, of xenophobia, of hysterical illiberalism, uh, hysterical, uh, what, they're not going away anytime soon. 
uh, regardless of the outcome of a particular elections. Indeed, as we are seeing this phenomenon of uh, uh, the appeal of the strong man, the phenomenon of the non-ideological personalism in government is on the rise worldwide. And to appreciate this, I commend to you the work of Andrea Kendall Taylor, who is now the Deputy National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council. So she's uh, an analyst in our government looking at the most sensitive classified information. She's also an accomplished scholar and has published widely in the unclassified realm. And Andrea just published last week in Foreign Affairs an interesting piece about the, the new dictators, why personalism rules. Uh, and she talks about Central Europe and also about Russia and China and places further afield around the world. And it's a reminder that what we see happening in Central Europe is not unique to Central Europe, but it's part of a global trend. And what Andrea says, and this is why I say that things are not going to get better very quickly, is that she reminds us that rising global turmoil and insecurity indicate that the trend toward personalism is likely to, sis, per, likely to persist, eliciting a widespread backlash against the core democratic values of freedom of expression and individual empowerment because uh, a growing share of citizens worldwide see strong leaders as a better option than volatility and chaos in the international community and at home. And, as, and the research suggests, she writes, that as individual fears of societal change and external threats grow, so too does the preference for strong, decisive leaders who are willing to use force to maintain order. This has happened in our past, it's happened in Europe's past, and it's happening now here in the United States and in Europe. And this is not just about what happens in the domestic politics of a country, uh, but it also affects the international arena quite directly because personalist dictators uh, pursue aggressive foreign policies. They make difficult and unpredictable partners because they have no constraints in their own systems on, on uh, whims and emotions and appeals to popular uh, emotions. So um, uh, if we think that the world is going to continue to be chaotic and violent and difficult, then I think we're going to continue to see an appeal uh, in our politics here and in Europe uh, to leaders that try to simplify and explain uh, that the enemy abroad and the enemy within must be vanquished uh, and the temptations to uh, short circuit civil liberties and due process and uh, proper democratic debate will only grow. So the challenge will continue to grow. On the other hand, resources are not growing. And those of us who are in the part of the government where we uh, have an opportunity to shape the way that foreign assistance is being managed and spent know that right now in this region of Europe, between the EU and Russia and the Middle East, we are the, the parts of the world that my bureau at USAID is focused on, we know that uh, notwithstanding the earmark that the Congress uh, installed last December in the current year's appropriation that ele elevated our available resources for Ukraine and the neighborhood, we still are less than half of where we were six or eight years ago in terms of the resources available in Eastern Europe for a whole range of assistance programs from energy infrastructure to um, uh, economic growth to health and education uh, to say nothing about the potential for supporting initiatives in the democracy, human rights, and governance realm. So um, if we in this room and the people who are going to participate today think that more ought to be done in America's engagement in this region, then we're going to have to build a uh, broader, deeper consensus that we're willing to put our resources where our policy intentions uh, take us. And as we do that, as we think about the possibility of doing more to support democratic voices and democratic forces in Eastern Europe, um, I also am hoping that in the, the rebooting and whatever the next administration looks like as they think about this region and these policies, that we will add to what we have done historically in terms of supporting democratic processes and good governance and begin to think harder about what the content of those processes ought to be. Uh, we have often been tempted over the last 25 years of promoting democracy and human rights and good governance in Eastern Europe to pick winners to decide that one leader or one party is more like us, is more democratic, is more likely to uh, govern well than the available alternatives. Uh, but we've usually resisted coming in forcefully on the, uh, in support of one or another candidate or party in other countries' elections as they have become more democratic. Um, and we've reverted back to process and procedure, which I think most of the time has been the right answer. But 
Uh, I think going forward, we need to think harder about what are the content of these procedures and think more about what the liberal values that this conference today is about, what are the implications of uh, tolerating illiberal values, illiberal sentiments, illiberal political movements and forces and leaders, and think about whether there's a way for us to be more clear about uh, the kind of uh, policies and uh, values and principles that we want to see embodied in our partners, uh, just as we continue to argue that and debate that here in our own country, um, whether process should trump values or whether values ultimately matter more than the procedures. So um, these are challenges that uh, I'm going to leave for my colleagues and my successors at USAID in the coming months. Um, but I think uh, the wider community of those of us, those of you who care about Central and Eastern Europe uh, may want to revisit this and think, think harder about how we promote our values as well as uh, good democratic procedures. And so with that, I look forward to uh, listening to the conversation today and bringing that uh, home to our, our deliberations in the U.S. government. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Tom and Damon, for uh, the opening remarks. I'm Alina Poyakova. I'm the deputy director here at the Eurasia uh, Center of the Atlantic Council. And it's really my pleasure to see so many uh, new faces and some familiar faces in the room, which I think signals to us that this is an incredibly important topic and this is a very timely discussion uh, to be having the conversation about where Central and Eastern Europe is heading today and in the next short, medium, and long-term years. I am really delighted to moderate this very distinguished panel uh, who's here with us today. Uh, a nice mix of Americans and Europeans, some who travel from very far, like Brian and, and Yvonne as well. Uh, I'll quickly introduce all of our panelists and then we'll just have an interactive conversation uh, followed by Q&A with all of you. So to my immediate left is uh, Maria Stefan, Dr. Maria Stefan who's a senior policy fellow at the United States Institute of Peace and also a senior fellow here with us at the Atlantic Council. Uh, Maria has worn many very impressive hats in and out of government. Uh, she was a foreign affairs officer in the U.S. State Department's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, but she really works on this question of civil resistance and its relevance for violent conflict, has focused a lot on Poland, which of course is a country we'll be discussing at length today. So thank you, Maria, for joining us. And next to Maria, we have uh, Dr. Ivan Stefanitz. I uh, hope I pronounced that right. Uh, who's here, who's one of our panelists who's here from Europe. And we're delighted that you're able to join us. Uh, Ivan is a member of the European Parliament. Uh, he is from Slovakia and a former member of the Slovak National Council, uh, where he's worked quite extensively on issues of European integration, now continues that work uh, in regards to EU integration and the session, potential session process with Ukraine. So thank you for being with us today as well. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, and then uh, to Ivan's left, uh, we have the well-known and renowned <laughs> Brian Whitmore, who's here with us from Prague. Uh, Brian is uh, you know, working with RFERL as a senior correspondent there, but of course many of us know him for his uh, Power Vertical podcast and the blog that is serving to inform all of us about uh, Russia's dealings in Eastern Europe and beyond. So thank you, Brian, for being with us. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, we have the ever more impressive uh, Dr. Jeffrey Gedman, who is also a senior fellow uh, here with us uh, at the Future Europe Initiative at the Atlantic Council, a senior fellow at Georgetown University School of Foreign Affairs, and has, served, has worn many, many hats, including as former head of the Legatum Institute, uh, former head of Radio Free Radio Liberty. So really thank you for joining us here today as well, Jeff. Uh, so without f further ado, the, the title of this conference, uh, which we're delighted to host together with our partners today, uh, IRI, SIP, and Radio Free Radio Liberty, and in cooperation, of course, with the National Democratic Institute. Uh, but many of us uh, were really concerned about the trends that we are seeing today in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, this idea of the illiberal state, uh, re-emerging, you could say, 
uh, again, in the countries that we thought were very clearly on a certain specific path of development towards Western values, liberal democratic values. And most notably, Hungary and Poland are the two countries that are often mentioned here as, as the cases to watch. And but in other places as well, far-right populists, anti-EU, Eurosceptic parties on the left and the right are gaining at the polls across the regions. Uh, in Slovakia, just in the elections this spring, uh, the far right gained a combined 17% of the vote in, in the parliament, which is a first in that country as far as I know. So as other Central Eastern European states may follow suit as disenchantment with the EU continues to grow, anxieties about terrorism, the refugee crisis, crisis continue to put more pressure on national governments. I wanna open this up to you, Jeff. Uh, you have worked in this region for many, many years. You've seen the democratic transition unfold across the post-socialist space. Are those of us who are voicing concern, uh, are we doing so prematurely? Um, are there really these illiberal trends? Are we seeing democratic backsliding in the region? Uh, should we actually be concerned? Are we really ringing, <coughs> ringing the alarm bells a little too early? Alina, thank you. Uh, I don't think it's premature. Uh, I think it's vigilance, but I also think there's a context for all this. So let me, if I could, just take a moment to tell you what I think uh, the context is that might help frame our conversation this morning. The, the first thing is, uh, I think we broadly in this community and friends of the region uh, were a little bit impatient and a little bit naive in thinking that in a decade or so, these countries would, so to speak, graduate from the school of democracy. Okay? We think that sometimes. We Americans think that sometimes. A and the fact is, it takes time to plant institutions and sink deep roots. But democracy is not just about institutions. It's not just about fair and free elections and independent media and independent judiciary and free trade unions. It is all those things. But it's also about habits and values and behaviors. And it takes time in the face of history, in the context of culture, to develop those things. I would add that democracy is very hard to grow, but it's very hard to maintain. So this morning we're focused on Central Europe. Look at Western Europe. Look, as Tom Melia said, at the United States of America today. Who would have thought? I mean, democracy is things like social contract comprising loyal opposition, the peaceful transfer of power, the idea that you defeat your opponent, but you don't destroy your opponent. That's not democracy. So I'd just like to say, first of all, it's hard. We started, our colleagues, our friends, our allies started, but I think it was generally naive to think that in a decade or decade and a half, you've arrived. The second thing I would say, Alina, is uh, of course it's true that democracy has to be homegrown. We've heard that a thousand times, so let it be repeated. It can't be imposed, and we can't dictate it. We, whoever we are, IMF, World Bank, NDI, even the Atlantic Council can't impose democracy <laughs> around, around the world, even the Atlantic Council. At the same time, external actors do matter, and I think if you look at the last 15 years, a couple of things happened that are troubling. First of all, the European Union became preoccupied with other things, important things, sovereign debt crisis, Greek bailouts, but turned in some sense away from the project of growing and helping and supporting and nurturing this region. The United States, if you look back, you know, 40,000 feet above, we pivoted away twice, didn't we? Once to the war on terror and once to Asia so to speak, but we did reallocate our political capital, our diplomatic capital, our resources, in part because we thought this project, so to speak, was complete, and of course it wasn't. And then of course, last but not least, that other external actor, Russia. As we pivoted away, Vladimir Putin's Russia pivoted back. And so there's no misunderstanding. The problems are homegrown. It's not Russia behind everything but as a nudger, aider, a better, dropping poison, using disinformation, using corruption and kleptocracy as initiatives and instruments of power and influence, we pivot away. Democracy is not complete, so to speak, and rushes back. That's a difficult combination. Let me leave you with this thought. Where are we now? 
Um, it was the British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, who once said to the question, what do politicians fear most? You know this quote, he said, events, dear boys, events. <laughs> so bloody hell, you know, <laughs> of all times, refugees, terrorism, populism, new nationalism, new relativism, hearty Euroscepticism, now terribly inconvenient. Mm -hmm. But that's the context and that's what we have to deal with. Thanks, Jeff, for putting all that on the table. A lot of challenges, a lot of things that we need to think about. I think we will come back to Russia, of course. Um, that's something that we will discuss at length with, with Brian as well. Uh, I want to stay on the region for a moment. You brought up this idea of the incomplete democracy. Right, the idea that we're all waiting for the end of history, and then the end of history didn't come. Uh, and of course, Hungary and, and Poland as well have now become these emblematic countries where we see the rise of what uh, Prime Minister Orban has called the illiberal state. Uh, Jeff, just stay with you for just a second about Hungary, because we can't not talk about Hungary. Um, do you see Hungary as a model for other countries to follow in the regions, or is this something that's really just a temporary, uh, ephemeral uh, consequence of the processes you describe? Well, Alina, I don't know if it's a model. It's a case study and not a very happy one. Uh, and I think it's a good case study because I think it, it really warrants a lot of unpacking. I won't try to do that, and you have other distinguished speakers who are ready to move on with the conversation. I, I would say um, it, it, it's very important uh, question. Uh, do we have an Orban problem? Or do we have a Hungarian problem? Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to suggest probably both, but remember it's a country where a party like Jobbik, anti-Semitic, xenophobic, illiberal in every sense of the world, word, but can, can become the third largest party in the parliament. Mm -hmm. Second question, uh, do we conflate things? Uh, I happen to have known or know Viktor Orban since the 1990s when he was first 34 years old, a member of parliament, before becoming prime minister for the first time. Orban's always been a Euroskeptic, a Margaret Thatcher-style Euroskeptic mm -hmm. that has not favored the transfer of great amounts of sovereignty from national capitals to Brussels. Does that make him an authoritarian or a Putinista? Not so sure. He's always been a social conservative. Now, some of you may deplore that, but social conservatism is actually part of the fabric of our democracy in the United States of America. But then there are other developments that suggest erosion of rule of law, erosion of checks and balances, and then suddenly a kind of feeling of where do I belong within an alliance? And there's America on the other hand, and Russia on the other hand, and Hungarian national <laughs> interests somehow in between. All problematic. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great case study. My fear is that what's happening in Budapest and Warsaw will tell us more about the next 10 years in this region than the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. But my hope is we can unpack it and understand what's tolerable, what's intolerable, and then how to work with allies to fix it. Thank you, Jeff. And to stay on the region, uh, Jeff already you brought up Poland. So Maria, I want to <coughs> jump over to you. Um, in addition to the shifts we've seen in politics in the region, this turn to the right, you could say the turn away from Europe in some of these countries. Uh, Poland, on the other hand, has had one of the most vibrant largest civil society movements against socialism, the solidarity movement, which many of us know about. Uh, but now that country as well faces the similar challenges in maintaining that vibrant civic space. So you work on these issues of civil resistance, nonviolent mm -hmm. movements, and their relevance to transformation, democratic development. Uh, what role should civic groups and NGOs continue pl to play in promoting democratic values in the region and specifically in Poland? Sure. So Lena, thanks very much, and thanks to the council for hosting this important uh, conversation today. Um, I think, you know, building on some of Jeff's points and to your point about specifically the role of civil society, uh, as Jeff noted, it takes time to build and develop habits, um, values, and behaviors. In other words, it takes time to develop a democratic culture. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can um, imagine the development of such a culture without an active, engaged citizenry. Um, as sort of the cornerstone uh, of democratic development. And as we talk about the rise of right-wing populist movements, as we talk about, as you noted, the closing space of civil society that is happening not just in Europe but all around the world, um, 
perhaps the best bulwark against those things is a civil society that's capable of organizing and that's capable mm -hmm. of holding governments um, accountable. We know empirically um, through work that both Freedom House did about a decade ago on a study, How Freedom is Won, and in the book that Erica Chenoweth and I wrote a few years ago, Why Civil Resistance Works, that bottom-up coalitions and movements are um, the most significant drivers of both democratic breakthroughs and in consolidating democracies after transitions happen. Um, so we need to think about um, how civil societies and citizen groups stay engaged, not just in the mass mobilization part. So you think about Ukraine, twice mm -hmm. mass people power movements remove strongmen from power. But I think, you know, just thinking about the case of Ukraine, civil society has really given Euromaidan staying power. Um, because civil society plays an important role in holding governments accountable, in challenging endemic corruption. Um, so an interesting case in Ukraine, which is facing, as you know, as the expert on this country, uh, tremendous um, obstacles in reforming uh, corrupt um, institutions, is that you've had this real um, vibrant civil society that's coalesced around reform packages. So one example of that being the reanimation package of reforms, which has brought together about a dozen different civic groups um, to mobilize, rally, and hold the government accountable um, to, to various um, uh, reform packages. So this is critical. In the case of Poland, yes, so this is another country that's taken an autocratic turn. Um, the Law and Justice Party um, has uh, attacked free media has attacked independent judiciary, but what you saw emerge um, in the wake of some of these measures has been, in the history of Polish organizing, um, the uh, Committee for the Defense of Democracy, the KOD, which um, was uh, created in November of last year and has organized the most uh, significant mass protests and demonstrations since the fall of the communist regime to challenge some of these autocratic um, moves by the government. And as some of you were probably tracking last week, the Polish women rose up um, to challenge a particular uh, government policy that would have criminalized um, all aspects of um, uh, abortion. So it would have terminated um, and held doctors um, uh, liable, criminally liable for facilitating abortion. So for three days, with the support of the Committee for the Defense of Democracy and other civic groups, the women engaged in mass demonstrations, strikes, and won, actually. In this particular instance, they forced the government to backtrack on this particular piece of legislation. And so it's a stepping stone, but it just mm. shows the necessity of engaging and supporting this type of citizen activity. Well, thank you, Maria. Thanks for bringing in uh, Ukraine, of course. We're focusing today on Central Eastern Europe, but we can't forget about the countries that are still aiming to enter the EU, despite all the problems and potential challenges the EU continues to face. Uh, so I will come back to kind of tying together Poland and, and Hungary and this idea of the autocratic regime rise and the role of civil society. Because, of course, as we see in Ukraine, despite the most harshest circumstances, the most corrupt regime, uh, you still have the ability with a vibrant civil society, with a mobilized population that believes in their ability to determine their future, to rise up and say no to when things go too far. Uh, but Ivan, I really want to bring you into this conversation as well. Uh, Jeff made an interesting point. Um, he said that he thought, or he feared, that what's happening in Warsaw and Budapest today will deter might determine what will happen in the region for the next 10 years. Uh, you know, you are our expert in Slovakia. You are from the region yourself. Uh, Slovakia faces a difficult uh, political situation, as we talked about earlier already. But it also now has an opportunity to make its mark on the European Union. Slovakia holds the presidency of the Council of the European Union right now. Uh, you yourself are really in the center of these conversations in the European Parliament. Um, and one thing that Slovakia has said is a priority for it, for the presidency, is to promote a globally engaged Europe that seeks to maintain the momentum of the accession process across the region and beyond. Uh, so could you tell us a bit more how you see the current situation in Slovakia and how can the, the current opportunity for the presidency promote 
liberal democratic values in the region with perhaps uh, a note on civil society specifically. Sure, thank you very much, Alina, for question and for invitation. Well, situation in Slovakia is not as difficult as in Hungary and Poland, uh, and also the situation in Czech Republic is not as difficult as Hungary and Poland, but it is very much connected because so-called uh, V4 countries, they cooperate very much. They have very often common position also on the European level, so they, they are really together and they influence each other. I think particularly talking about uh, Slovakia, situation is also getting worse, as you mentioned also, and your opening remarks uh, after uh, this year's elections because we have first time in the parliament uh, far-right party which officially uh, came to the parliament with the program to step out from EU and step out from NATO. So far it has been general consensus in Slovakia about uh, foreign policy, about our security policy, but now it is not because mm -hmm. of these far-right extremists. Uh, in my view, there are three points which uh, should be addressed. And uh, first point is education. I think we forgot uh, to talk about education and to do something uh, for our students, for our young people. And I think this is the point which is valid not only for Slovakia, but for the whole Europe. Yeah. In most countries, just the young students are not educated about modern history. When I go to the schools to, for, for different discussions. They simply don't know why they, they, we are in EU, what was history, what was 1989 revolution, what, uh, what is really democracy for? So we forget to teach them about democracy. And I, I agree very much with Jeff's point that uh, it must be continuous process. It is not just to establish rules and it works. It is not like in economics or in politics, which is easier, but in <laughs> talking about democracy, and talking about democratic rules, we have to still work on that. Mm -hmm. And learning is also, and that's the second point, um, civic society, as Marina has mentioned. Civic society is not as strong as 20 years ago mm -hmm. in Central Europe. There is no voice of NGO which would be raised during scandals, during really major issues. Uh, there is no, basically no NGO talking about Russian propaganda about Brexit, about major security <coughs> threats. So uh, unfortunately, I have to say, it has been al already mentioned also today, that US a little bit stepped back from Central Europe. And this, this uh, room has been filled by Russia, by Russian propaganda. And uh, that's, that's quite a serious issue, because uh, uh, that's official Russian policy so-called hybrid war, yeah. so-called uh, propaganda during uh, or throughout web, throughout the IT tools. And uh, the, according to last research, 30% of young people, they prefer so-called alternative media rather than traditional ones. So it means just they believe much more propaganda than real media. And uh, as we can see, uh, the result of elections, just talking about Slovakia right now, uh, almost 30% of uh, people who came first time to vote, they voted for far right. It was the, the result for far right extremists. Just young people who didn't have proper education, who didn't have proper experience with, with uh, democracy. So we, we have to work with them. That's really the challenge for politicians, for NGOs, for academics, for teachers. So we have to, to change our role and we have to face uh, these challenges. And uh, you mentioned uh, also a very important fact that uh, Slovakia currently first time uh, holds um, EU presidency. And I have to say that's that's interesting fact which uh, has been recognized because Slovak uh, prime minister, he's by the way former communist, and he's closer to Russia than to European Union. So in this context, very, very similar policy like Viktor Orban in Hungary. And uh, what, he, what he did in past, he addressed different topic in Slovakia than in Brussels. For example, in Brussels, he voted for uh, sanctions against Russia because of situation in Ukraine. But when he came back to Bratislava, he said in Slovakia, I'm against sanctions. And similar policy was uh, practiced uh, by Viktor Orban, by the way. Mm. So this double-faced. But now during EU presidency, 
He's not doing that because it's not possible. So at least uh, we, we, we look like very pro-European uh, country. He tries to do his best because he is now very much visible. He cannot have double face. But, uh, and I have to say, from economical point of view, he puts uh, all the right things. He puts, uh, for example, TTIP in place, which I'd like to speak later on, which is very, very important from Central Europe for the whole Europe, and I do believe for EU, EU US trans, uh, partnership. So we have to talk about econo economical consequences as well. But uh, uh, what is, what is uh, uh, he's doing, so he's working on economical issues, but he's not working on development of democracy. So I think it should be addressed also those uh, issues regarding education and regarding uh, uh, NGOs uh, during uh, our presidency and uh, that's the challenge which is not used. Absolutely. So you brought up some very interesting topics that I think all of us will have to come back to uh, after we talk about Russia. Uh, one of them, of course, is the youth. Right, the fact that young people, while they support the EU more than older generations still across the European Union, they're really a, in a vulnerable situation. As you mentioned, Ivan, in, in Slovakia, many turned out to vote uh, for the far right. Many first-time wo voters, 30%, also voted for the far right. And what does this really tell us about where these countries are going, where the next generation is potentially at the brink as well of turning away from the EU uh, in many ways as the older generation has started to do as well. And, and wh I wanna pick this up and also wanna talk about the drivers of this, which one of them you already mentioned, which I think is the economy and this question of trade and where's that leading us, right? We see some of these patterns in the US as well, of course. Uh, but Brian, we can't uh, stay away from Russia uh, anymore, even though we might like to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So in many thanks to your work at RFERL, I think it's becoming common knowledge that uh, Russia's strategy for Central and Eastern Europe uh, is not benign, but that in, in fact it seeks to exploit, magnify uh, the fragmentation within and between countries. Uh, whether that be through disinformation campaigns, which Jeff already noted, political networks of influence, including kleptocratic networks, uh, or other ways of trying to undermine democratic values in the country. Um, at the same time, as Jeff also already mentioned, Maria as well, most of the trends we're seeing in the region are domestically driven. So what, what can you really pinpoint for us? What exactly is Russia's role in this? And what kind of impact is this strategy of destabilization having on the region? Thank you, Alina, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for the invitation. You're right, the, these, these problems are not invented by Russia. Russia didn't invent xenophobia in Europe, but it's exploiting it. Russia didn't invent Euroscepticism, but it's certainly exploiting it. Russia didn't invent anti-Americanism in Europe. It's been there for a long time. I, I know, I live there. Um, but it's certainly exploiting it. Russia didn't invent corruption in Europe, but it's exploiting it. What Russia is doing, and you alluded to this a bit, Alina, is that they're holding up a mirror and a magnifying glass mm -hmm. to our own weaknesses and using them back against us. Um, and I think what is going on in Central and Eastern Europe and in the Visegrad Four is just a reflection of what's going on throughout the Western world. Because they're doing the same thing in Western Europe and they're doing th same th the same thing in North America. So I, I think what we're seeing in, in, in the Visegrad Four is, is not unique mm. in this sense. And I think the, the rise of illiberalism, as Jeff alluded to earlier, is not unique in this part of the world. I think we should be careful about singling out these, these four countries. Um, that said, we do see some results in Central and Eastern Europe. We see the Czech president is openly pro-Moscow. The Slovak prime minister is openly pro-Moscow. Um, the the, the, and, and of course, the, uh, the, the, the Hungarian prime minister, Mr. Orban, is openly pro-Moscow. The Polish case is very interesting because it is obviously not openly pro-Moscow, quite the opposite. But if you look at the Polish government, it is the one that resembles mm -hmm. the Putin regime the most which this in and of itself plays into Putin's illiberal agenda in Europe. So we're starting to see the results of this. I'm starting to feel the results of it. In the 15 years I've lived in the Czech Republic, I have noticed a noticeable increase in pro-Moscow sentiment mm -hmm. and a noticeable increase in anti-American sentiment and a noticeable increase in Euroscepticism among young and affluent people. Not, it is not among marginalized groups mm 
which you would expect to find this sentiment. I could think of a, a very interesting contrast that points this out. Uh, a, a young Czech guy who I know during the, the famous red line uh, situation in Syria when, when it looked as if the United States was going to begin bombing. And this, this gentleman was just outraged. How could mm -hmm. Obama do this? He's a killer. He's just as bad as Bush. And this is, this is a, 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 it doesn't matter who's president of the United States. You, you guys are aggressive. And then the last couple of weeks with the bombing of Aleppo with, with Russia, not a peep. Not a peep. And this is, this is a sea change from when I moved mm -hmm. to the region in 1999-2000 and now. And I think with this it would be reflected across all of the Visegrad Four, mm -hmm. and indeed across all of Europe. So yes, to answer your question, they're, they're, Russia is very skillfully exploiting weaknesses that are already there. Part of that, there's good news there, that if mm -hmm. we start to get our own house in order, if somebody is using a weapon against you, which is a mirror, well, if you could fix what's in the mirror, then you take that weapon away. And I think this is, this is something that, that we, the, the focus should be on ourselves as much as on the Russians here without letting the Russians off the hook because I think they're playing a very, very corrosive game here. Thank you, Brian, uh, for laying that out. I think uh, one thing I'd like to get you to talk about a little bit more is you mentioned that this, uh, the V4 countries are not unique, mm -hmm. right? That you know, Slovakia is not unique and some Czech Republic is not unique in other ways. Uh, so kind of the bigger picture, right? Russian strategy for the EU at large. Mm -hmm. um, can we see what's happening in the V4 sort of as a microcosm of that? Are there differences? I mean, I know Western Europe is a little bit outside your, your wheelhouse, but you live in the region. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, uh, how do you, what are the, the impacts that we're going to see from Russia's destabilization strategy beyond the region? And what does that really mean for the EU? more broadly? Big question. No, no, it's a very good question, but it's actually, fortunately, this is something I've been talking about around town all week, so it's kind of fresh in my mind. Um, I mean, put very bluntly, the European Union, the existence of the European Union, presents a domestic political problem for the Putin regime. The existence of the European Union. The existence of a transparent form of governance close to Moscow's borders, which acts as somewhat of a magnet on the most creative and, and productive part of the Russian population. This is a domestic problem for the Putin regime. I don't know when this shift happened, but there was, at some point, the Kremlin decided that the real threat, despite its rhetoric, was not the United States, it was not NATO, it was the EU. Mm -hmm. It was probably my guess that somewhere around the time Ukraine was ready to sign the, the, the association agreement. Um, but this, m this model of transparent governance that is close to Moscow's borders is a danger to this regime. This model of consensus-based integration is a threat to Moscow's coercive-based integration. And this idea, this, this miracle that 28 states could act together as one political unit goes against the, the very way that Moscow sees the world. Because the Putin regime looks at the world in, in, in I, I often joke that Putin wants to party like it's 1815. Um, he wants to go back to the Holy Alliance. He wants to go back to this Westphalian world of empires where great powers have agency and small powers are playthings in their hands and have no agency. And I think th this regime truly believes this. It believes that civil society doesn't exist. Civil society is something that must be manipulated. Therefore, you had the Euromaidan and, well, we, we didn't do that, so the Americans must have done it. Mm -hmm. Um, that civil society has no agency. The Ukrainians have no agency. Small nations have no agency. The Czechs, the Slovaks, the Hungarians, and the Poles have no agency. They are small powers. So the existence of the European Union and this consensus-based integration is mm -hmm. a, a threat to their very worldview. And therefore, it must be destroyed. It must be destroyed. And I, I don't think I'm engaging in hyperbole here. I do believe that the goal of this Kremlin is the destruction, nothing short of the destruction of the European Union. It, by pulling it apart. And to do this, they've, they've weaponized a whole series of things. We, we spend so much time talking about the information war. Um, I've been talking about it till I'm blue in the face. I can talk about it in my sleep. I spoke about it in Prague a couple weeks ago, in Tbilisi one week ago, and I'll speak about it in Warsaw in two weeks' time. Um, so I can, I can give this talk in my speech, but what, but in my sleep. But one thing I always say about the, the information war is let's not just fetishize this, because this is part of a whole broad spectrum of, of, of non-kinetic tools of war. And make no mistake, Russia is at war. It sees itself as at war with mm -hmm. Europe right now. And it's weaponized everything from, from information to corruption, to organized crime, um, to electoral politics, um, with the, with the, again, with the financing of not just Jovic in Hungary, but the National Front in France, which mm -hmm. might well win the next presidential election. Right. 
And if, we, if, that, if that happens, you can, you can say mission accomplished pretty much in the destruction of the European Union. So the, there is a broader strategy. What's going on in the Visegrad Four, I think, is, is a reflection of that strategy. And this is one of the weakest links because mm. the democratic the, um, the institutions are not as strong there for obvious reasons as they are in, in the countries farther to the West. So I think you're seeing a lot more immediate success in some of these countries than, than, than you are in the West. But there is a broad strategy here. And it's, 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 it, and it's something we need to take very, very seriously. Ivan, I want to bring you into this. Uh, I was surprised at one thing you mentioned in your remarks uh, about Slovakia specifically, that you weren't aware of a think tank of a lot of research being done specifically on this question of influence, Russian disinformation, the things that uh, Brian is noticing uh, taking root in the Czech Republic and elsewhere. Uh, but some of the comments that, the very troubling comments that I think Brian has made, I tend to agree with about, you know, that the Kremlin's goal is, in fact, the destruction of the European Union, destruction of an alternate, alternate point of view, an alternate worldview that is now based in the same ideology the Kremlin sees itself um, as putting out there. Uh, is, are the V4 countries a weak link, like Brian said, um, in, in, in this broader strategy of, of, of Russian influence? What are your thoughts? Yes, it is. The answer is yes, because of uh, so-called traditional links be, uh, between Russia and Central Europe, uh, you know, and still because of economical dependence, dependence, particularly in energy. And that was the topic I want to yeah. add to this. Uh, there's a very strong economical impact, uh, but now particularly to Russia, uh, because we are not so much dependent on Russia, but Russia is dependent on EU very much. Most of um, Russia's budget is coming from energy prices, from energy. Your EU is the major customer. And uh, Russia is trying to use energy as the political tool to divide Europe. They have different crude oil and particular gas prices for different uh, countries, despite market is there, but they don't use market price. They, don't, they use Gazprom, which is state-owned company, basically Putin's company, as the political tool, and they used it for Ukraine, for you. <laughs> For uh, President uh, Yanukovych at that time, it was priced below $200 uh, dollars per, uh, for, for gas. Now it's over 500 more than three times more. For Belarus, it is different than, than for Slovakia. Slovakia, by the way, has more expensive gas price than Germany. And Poland is mo has more expensive than, than Slovakia, and so on and so on. They use it as the political. So for Russia, it's the major concern that Europe would act united, and we, we know about that. Therefore, we are going to work, and we are working on that actually, on energy union. Mm -hmm. And that's the major threat for, for Russia, uh, for their not only political, but economical impact. Therefore, they target different political parties which work against the European unity. You begin Hungary, mm -hmm. uh, far-right extremists in Slovakia, Front National in France, and so on and so on. And they are really, there are official evidences that they finance that. Just all the parties and all the, uh, all the people who are against European unity. That's right, this uh, strange bedfellow relationship that the Russian government has developed with far-right populists across Europe it uh, has been going on for some time, but I think it's important to keep talking about it uh, because it's not just isolated incidents, as I think everybody on this panel is pointing out. This is, uh, co these are connected efforts. They're part of a broader strategy to sow uh, disinformation, mistrust um, in our basic democratic values. And Maria, I wanna loop back to you on this. Uh, you know, civil society, I just want to go back to this idea of how uh, Russia has actually been using its toolkit of influence, you want to call it that, to not just in the energy sector, not through just kleptocracy, but also to undermine uh, the vibrancy of a pro-democratic liberal civil society across the region. Some of the trends that Brian has outlined over the last 15 years, is this also something that you're observing in the civil society space? Yeah, um, and I think, so where I would quibble maybe a little bit with what Brian said about uh, Putin are believing that civil society has no agency. I think he knows the power of civil society's agency, mm -hmm. which is why he's expending so much time, energy, resources, effort mm -hmm. to suppress civil society, whether it's the Ream 
of anti-NGO laws, declaring uh, civic groups foreign agents, um, which means spies essentially in Russia, uh, making foreign funding of NGOs um, all but impossible. And you know, the whole fear of the so-called color revolutions um, is omnipresent. So I think just the extent to which Putin you know, is focusing on making organized citizen activity even possible demonstrates the power of, of this form of activity. So I think it's there. And your point, you know, Putin's not alone. Dictators have a handbook. Like they, they tend to do the same 10 things to suppress civil society. It's not surprising anymore. People have written about the so-called velvet fist. It's no longer just relying on brute repression, arrests, harassment, torture, killings. That's all there. Um, it's being used in Russia and elsewhere. But there's soft forms. Um, and there's co-optation elements. There's creation of gongos, um, the so-called the, the pseudo-civil society. Yes. So the creation to suppress a truly independent, um, you know, engaged citizenry in order to pre prevent any organized threat um, uh, to their power, and that's that's the problem that these organized civic groups pose. So, but otherwise, I agree uh, with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess we'll have to agree to disagree on that. My, I, in the past, I did take this view that Putin was basically cynical, and this was just rhetoric. But over the past year or so, I've basically come to the conclusion that he actually believes his own hype. Mm -hmm. And that even things like the, the foreign agent's law, implicit in that is that civil society doesn't have its own agency. It is a tool of foreign powers. It's a tool of the Europeans, or it's a tool most likely of the Americans, and most likely even more specifically of the State Department mm -hmm. or the CIA. Um, so I think even in the, in, the, in the way this legislation has played out, um, Putin understands the power of civil society, but he doesn't believe civil society is an independent mm. thing. He thinks, in my opinion, and again, we're getting into Putin's head, and that's a very, very dark place where it's hard <laughs> to see anything. So I guess so with, the, with, the, with the necessary caveats here that, that, that I'm speculating as, as, as well as anybody that tries to get into that very dark place that is, is Putin's psyche, but I believe he actually believes his own hype right now. I think I, I, I'm, I'm in that place. But one of the things that being a Russia watcher teaches you the hard way is epistemological modesty because we're always adjusting our, our, our belief. But that's where I am right now. I think he believes his own hype. So there is, there's this duality there, right? Because on the one hand, we've seen uh, the Kremlin under Putin's most recent term move very uh, quickly to repress any form of civil society, freedom of expression in Russia. After the 2001, 2012 protests, I think really shook the regime because it, uh, planted this fear that something like a color re revolution mm -hmm. could happen in Moscow, right? So I think there's an understanding that civil society, this grassroots reference are absolutely key for democracy, yet there's also a fear of that and potentially uh, a view that these are, you know, ma just manipulations by the West, et cetera. Uh, but Jeff, you know, I wanna kind of bring you into this conversation. We put a lot um, on the table. Uh, and I, I kind of want to uh, put you on the spot and get us to kind of bring it all together a little bit. Uh, so just a small effort uh, for you, I think. Um, you know, we've talked about these uh, trends in Russian strategy towards Eastern Europe, that Central Eastern Europe is a potentially weak link in the region. Uh, you mentioned yourself about your fears for the next 10 years. Uh, Maria has mentioned that dictators learn right, across, uh, across contexts, across countries. Uh, and of course, Ivan has highlighted the, the energy and the economic aspect of all this. So, I don't know, can you give us a big view of how all these pieces fit together? Um, what the domestic drivers that are pushing these populist parties forward, the anti-EU sentiments, the disenchantment, and on the other hand, coming from the top, you know, Russia's uh, influence in all of this. Um, Alina, thank you. First of all, you all are a great panel. I wish I were in the audience. <laughs> I think it's really interesting. I'm taking a lot of notes. Um, maybe some thoughts in no order of importance. First of all, to, to Yvonne's comment about democracy never being complete, uh, there's a book I commend, uh, Tom Mealy was commending and recommending reading. I'm going to recommend one, too. There's a German writer named Werner Petrus, P-E-T-E-R-S, who wrote some years ago a book about democracy in America, and it's called the existential runner, and it's not just about democracy in America, it's about democracy. And when are you done? Never look at the state of our politics. So back to my original point. It's hard, the institutions and values and habits and behaviors, and we have to adapt constantly. 
And so uh, Maria said, you know, dictators work from a handbook. Well, we do too, or ought to, but boy, you better update that manual all the time and be very agile and very creative. Second thing I was going to say on economy that Alina just mentioned, um, it, it's something, Yvonne touched upon it, it's something that panels like this, we're mostly political people up here, uh, probably don't give or certainly don't give enough attention to uh, this country to. We need jobs and growth. Europe needs jobs and growth. Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe and Southern Europe, jobs and growth. And that's something that business people and economists and the top political folks among us ought to work much more uh, uh, in a much more collaborative focused manner. The thing, footnote I'd add to that, uh, and concern I have going forward. We, we always look at a screen and we see 13 things and we, we struggle in managing those 13 or 17 things. There are all those things that are not on the screen quite yet. Or if they're on, they're on the periphery and not in the center. Having to do with economy, having to do with political cohesion, technology and developments now in robotics and artificial uh, intelligence. They're going to have big impact here in Europe. I don't know if it's eight years or 11 years or 14 years or 19 years, but I know enough to know that driverless vehicles, that's the tip of the iceberg, and it's going to have dramatic impact on workforce structure, employment, social cohesion, and political stability. The last thing I'd say, Alina, is uh, as is often the case, and me too, we talk a lot in discussions like this about Kremlin, are we inside his head? Are we on top of his head? Are we on his chin? What is he thinking? What does he want? What is he really about? What really makes him tick, you know? We seldom or not sufficiently talk enough about what we do want. And somehow that's been slipping and sliding. Yeah. Here in the United States, in the administration, the opposition, for me, it's no longer clear what our vision is and what our strategy is. I think we're in a moment where both Europe and the United States find ourselves in a big, bit of a pickle. Uh, I'm somehow kind of on to quoting British politicians today, but remember Winston Churchill who said, democracy, worst form of government except compared to everything else. Well, guess what? It actually still applies. And right now, democracy is broken. To some extent, different ways in different places, but it's broken. Free enterprise since 2008, a big shock economically, financially, morally, intellectually, psychologically. Free enterprise needs to be repaired. But somehow, we, the Atlantic Council, the partner institutions, the next administration, the European Union, we've got to get back to an assertion of the ideals and principles we care about and be clear, what do we stand for? What are we willing to defend? How will we allocate resources? And how will we sacrifice? Right now, it feels to me like the West is on the defensive and kind of confused, and once again asking, what will he do next? And I think we want a world where he and the authoritarians are worrying, what will the Democrats do next? Thanks, Jeff. I want to give our, the rest of our panelists a chance to respond to what Jeff just put out there, starting with you, Brian. But I do want to mention that we're going to really dig down to all of these things you put on the table, that all of us have put on the table on media, the economy, what is the role of uh, the private sector in all of this. And then, of course, our last panel is going to focus on what is to be done, that big question. And, and so, Brian. Yeah, no, as Jeff was talking, I was having deja vu. Um, I, I felt like I was in 1977 or 70, 78, 79, because we've seen this movie before. Mm -hmm. Um, we remember the 70s. I, I'm old enough to remember the 70s. I, I, I think many of us in this room, if not most, are, are old enough to remember the 70s. But I remember this time when it seemed like the West was drifting. It seemed like we there was there was malaise across the land, to use the phrase that Jimmy Carter never actually used. Um, there, 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 there was angst. There was a sense that the Soviet Union was on the march and was invading places and, 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 and gaining on us. There was, there was terrorism in Europe. It wasn't coming from, from Islamic sources. It was coming from leftist sources financed by Moscow, but it was te terrorism nonetheless. The transatlantic relationship was in tatters. Western democracy was adrift. Mm -hmm. um, we all remember those times, but you know what? We also also know how that movie ended at the end of the day. And I think we can learn a bit from looking at why we were able to recover last time. And to use the negative example, 
I'm not old enough to remember the 30s, thank heavens. Um, but, but I think that the, the, the negative example at the 70s represents the positive example of that we've been through this before, we've gotten through it, let's look at what we did right last time to get out of it. What did we do wrong in the 30s? Because I think these are the two places, the two metaphors where, where, where we could be because there are a lot of parallels and they've been pointed out by a lot of people between Europe today and Europe in the 30s. Um, they're, they're frightening to contemplate, but I think they're not nonetheless real. So I think that we could, we could learn a little bit from history here. Mm -hmm. Ivan and Maria, did you want to respond to that? Yes. I very much agree with, with this just, just point that I think that's the lack of, of vision of currently, but I would put, I would put additionally uh, lack of uh, leadership as well. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have enough political leaders to, to establish this, this vision and to go through maybe except of Angela Merkel in, in Europe, but she's really alone. We need much, much more. Uh, such people like Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher. So really, we need um, a leadership for that. And um, still, I'd like to add one more economical point, uh, which is, in fact, political one. 25 years ago, Visegrad countries sold almost everything what they produced towards East. They traded between this, themselves, but towards East. Now, they shifted the whole production towards West. Uh, for example, Slovakia, just a small country, 90% of GDP is export. And from this, from this export, majority towards EU countries and, and, and so also towards West. So economically, this transition has been successful. It was not the case uh, regarding democracy, as we talked before. But talking about this vision, I think economy is very much connected with democracy as well. And I think we need to have also uh, economical vision for future. So taking into consideration also new technologies, I agree very much with the point of uh, new ITs and automated driving, uh, which imp will improve uh, productivity, but maybe there will be major shift of uh, job losses or in, in different, uh, just different job occupations. We have to talk about that and we have to have vision and I'm, I would very much like to have common EU, US vision. And therefore, for me, TTIP is very much uh, <laughs> it's so, so important. And for me, it is not uh, the, the end story because it's not only about an enlargement of common market. It's also about what to do with world trade, what to do with standards, mm -hmm. because Asia is growing very fast. If you don't establish standards together, we, EU, EU and uh, US, we will copy them. In a couple of years, we will be forced to copy them. I think we have to be more active to establish mm -hmm. standards of products, services, and just world trade. And we, ha we have to talk openly about this vision, about strengthening our cooperation. And uh, of course, security, fortunately, it is still going on. And, uh, but also economically, there are some opportunities. Thank you, and I know we will come back to this topic as well, so I hope you will stay, stick around for the conference and, and comment on the next panels. And Maria, before we go to the audience, did you want to respond to some Just of those Just very quickly, said? I would agree that we're on defense when it comes to uh, talk, even talking about democracy. You know, I think we're, we've become very shy and reticent to talk about democracy as being integral <laughs> to our national security and, frankly, to, to international security. And I think in an era of authoritarian resurgence, which mm -hmm. we're seeing around the world beyond Europe, now is not a time to decrease investment in democracy and governance, both in the U.S. government and beyond. Now is the time to think creatively about how to support civil society in ways to help them organize, to help them reopen democratic spaces and to defend democratic spaces that are being shut down. And so I think, you know, just having, um, being able to go back to that conversation and to defend the linkages between security and democracy has to be where we're going uh, moving forward. So I want to uh, open this up to the audience. So if you have a question you'd like to pose to our panelists, please raise your hand. There'll be mics coming around. I just ask that you introduce yourself and your affiliation. Um, sir, please, please wait for the mic. Uh, Herbert Regenbogen. Each of the contributions take up a fragment of the problem. But the, the undercurrent of a grand design of understanding the issues are still not emerged. I'll give you an example. We talk about the individual as having the democratic 
core of understanding which makes a country what it is. Yet we're talking about structures. We're talking about NGOs. We're talking about these different elements. But we don't talk about the Constitution. We don't talk about the treaty for the functioning of the EU, Article 3, which in includes those types of principles like the Bill of Rights. We don't talk about how this is being communicated to the people, the individuals. And as someone who teaches Europeans, I can tell you they're frustrated because this is the element that is not occurring. We're not talking with the people. We're talking at the people. So my problem here in this discussion is we're not getting to the core. And there are many other issues as well, but I just leave that for my first statement. Uh, thank you for your comment. Uh, anybody want to respond or we'll just let that one uh, stay as a comment, there was no question. No, I mean, I just, talking at the people, Vice, when I'm talking about movements and citizen organizing, this is all about human agency and citizens having the power in, in Europe and beyond. It's not us talking to them. And in fact, I mean, and that's what's been shown empirically is that citizen organizing and nonviolent resistance is what is is inherently responsible for democratic change and development. So it's nothing that, it's not about preaching, it's about supporting people who are ultimately responsible for bringing about change in their societies, Europe and beyond. And I also think this speaks to the question of, of uh, de democratic deficit within the EU. Uh, and I can tell you that we are thinking about these, this issue of strategic communications, why the EU has not been better at communicating specifically to young people uh, why the EU has been so successful in many ways versus focusing on the failures. And I do think this is changing, but it's very slow. Democracies move very slowly. We don't have the benefit of dictatorship to move us quickly. Uh, Ivan, do you want to comment on that? I'll go back yeah. to questions again. Yeah. Very quick comment. I agree with that uh, there is the lack of communication with people, and therefore they, this mistrust or the race of nationalism is also uh, based on this lack of communication, unfortunately, and we have much more tools, particularly social media. Unfortunately, extremists are much more skillful and much better in social media uh, in, uh, in most countries. So that's the challenge for politicians and civic society also to, to use new technologies. Thank you. Uh, more questions from the audience, please. Uh, in the back there, please, on um, that side. Ah, Bastian, hello. <laughs> Thank you, Bastian Hermsen of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. I have a question about the gender dimension of the illiberal term because the supporters of these movements and parties are largely men. And uh, it's no wonder, Maria, you pointed out the, the Polish demonstrations on women's rights, basically, that, that women have a lot to lose from these developments. And what does it mean for our policies, in your view? How should we respond to this dimension of it? Thank you. Who wants to pick up on the gender question? Well, just it's ironic, we just had last week at the U.S. Institute of Peace an event on women in nonviolent movements, with the idea being that women have played integral roles as organizers, strategists, tacticians in nonviolent movements. And often their stories are not told because they're not in the media, they're not the spokespeople, but they're often doing a lot of behind the scenes and beyond. So one of the, the policy recommendations that, flew, uh, that um, flowed from that conversation is ways to support women, not only as leaders of, of nonviolent movements, but helping them then translate um, involvement in citizen action into political power. So helping to ensure that gender equality becomes institutionalized um, in laws, rules, and regulations after these mass mobilization moments like what we're seeing in Poland and beyond. But women as you know, more than half the population and as having sort of unique um, assets in these, in these movements um, should be supported, their voices should be amplified. Absolutely, and I do think that Bastian brings up a really interesting point, which we've seen over the years. The people who vote for far-right populists do overwhelmingly tend to be men. And there is a certain, you could say, machismo to the rise of these authoritarian leaders um, across not just Europe, but perhaps in our own country as well. Uh, more questions, please. Yes, in the front. Good morning, um, Maria Clara Ludovici from Italy. I'm doing an internship for the American Legislative Exchange Council 
Uh, so my question is exactly, um, actually it's more a, a comment. I uh, would give you my, I would love to give you my experience as a young professional. I've been a student recently and uh, yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Stefanic, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, young adults don't really have a good basics of modern history. We study a lot from maybe ancient past, like the Roman Empire and so on. So it happened, so, so many things happened in our land, in Europe. But for that reason, we focus too much on what happened thousands of years ago, but we don't really study what's going on now, why we are in the EU, why, so the modern history. So that would be great to do something about it. So maybe to uh, focus more on the modern uh, history and so we can really be strong and, and, uh, and maybe influence other people afterwards. So for the, about the importance of the EU. This goes back to the strategic communication question, also education. Ivan, did you want to say something about that, yeah, you, just, Brian? Just one comment, I agree very much with that. Uh, and uh, we should talk not only about education of students, but also about education of teachers. Because very often, uh, teachers didn't have experience with their old ones and didn't have experience with new methods, and really they don't know still about democratic rules. So they should be educated first, but uh, it's very much needed uh, to change, uh, say, schooling system in most European countries. Because European Union, it's very much a developing project. It is not the fixed projects. It is not a federal state. It is a union yeah. of states. And uh, competencies are changing. Mm -hmm. Almost every year are changing. And people very much they don't understand what is about. <coughs> who is responsible for? What is the responsibility of national states? What is the responsibility of uh, European inst institutions? And it's also about democratic deficit. They complain, but they don't know very often what does it mean, democratic deficit? So that's uh, the complex issues, but I very much agree with you to improve education. Yeah, I just, uh, just want to ask a question to you because I had a recently had a conversation in Prague with, with, a, with a Slovak colleague, and she was telling me something that was just utterly fantastic to me that the, in, 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 higher in higher education, high school education, history does not proceed beyond the Second World War. Exactly, exactly. This is remarkable. That's, That's the right. point. This, it glosses over the, the you do, so students are not taught about the communist period and the post-communist right. period. That's yeah. remarkable. Yeah. Yes, that, <laughs> that, 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 may, uh, that's the point. They don't know anything about, even about communism. They don't know anything about Cold Why War. Why is that? Because, <laughs> <laughs> because there is not enough so, political will to change it. Because mm -hmm. uh, currently, uh, governments who are in charge, they don't want to change it. Because basically, they, they like to keep status quo. Uh, they are afraid of uh, to be too politicized, and they are afraid of tax. They are afraid of tax as well. Uh, can you please wait? Best? Let, let us wait for the microphone so we have more structured discussion. But if you would like to ask a question, please introduce yourself Sorry. as well. I just said it's uh, they are afraid of the past. A past? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, the politics. I understood it facts, but uh, <laughs> facts it's the past. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you can go. My name is Dorian, by the way, uh, from Washington uh, Language Center. Uh, I just would like to, uh, <coughs> to ask a question uh, to the panelists related to the um, role of uh, the emig emigration in this from the CEE uh, region um, and how this one plays into uh, the democratic backsliding. Thank you. Hmm. Immigration. Oh. Oh, what, what was the last, and how it plays into what? The democratic what? Backsliding. Backsliding. Backsliding, sorry. Um, let, let me, uh, I'd be happy to say something about that, but, but I don't want to let go uh, of the, the thread that we just had before because I think Herbert started it, you started it, and now we're on to it, and, and it's important. Um, lo and behold, democracy means rights and responsibilities, and including this country, where do you learn that? It's got to come from education, civic education, public figures, media, okay? Segway, media, you know, thinking about our country, my country right now. Remember, was it CBS, the CEO, who some months ago said, Donald Trump, bad for the country, great for media. I'll let you think about that. But that's worthy of a deeper conversation. I think that um, so-called elites have to connect to citizenry, and citizenry, citizens have responsibility too to connect to so-called elites. 
add a parenthesis to that, mm. and I think there are gaps, and people are neglected, and people have been forgotten in important places. But let's not forget also, as we're caught up in Fox News and MSNBC and <laughs> others, you know, some of these terrible, terrible, terrible elites, these terrible members of Congress, they actually have districts. You would almost think by reading the commentary that they were made in a factory in Bethesda. <laughs> they actually come from Ohio or Wyoming or Wisconsin or Texas, and they go back there every weekend, and they grew up there, and they went to school there, the elites. Um, on immigration, um, yes, I think it's a, a part of the subject. I'll leave the United States aside for a minute. That, that uh, These things are similar and different. But, but in Europe, uh, good heavens, Germany alone, within a period of 12 months, Germany, which is territorially the size of about Oregon, took in more than 1 million, more than 1.1 million refugees. And it was a, a magnificent gesture but it causes stress and strain on the politics and society uh, and the economy of that country for a variety of reasons. You had a follow-up question on that. No, no, I'm sorry. I thought you didn't have that to say. The question maybe I wasn't uh, articulate. Uh, the question was the role of emigration from the CE region in the West, ah. maybe in the United States, uh, how, and how this one played a role in this democratic backsliding in the past 10 years, let's say, right? Since well, 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 I like better the question I thought I heard. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's so good, that's good. Feel free to come in on both. <laughs> Thank you. Emigration into Western Europe? Honestly, the, those people have not been so, so involved, not, not very much in uh, Visegrad four countries. Sorry, uh, the human capital, the youth, emigrated, and not they are very little involved in these civil societies, uh, education, and so on. So basically, the role, sorry, the role to rebuild this civic society, it's it's in uh, the hands of our uh, parents or uh, the elderly again. So these majority of them, they grew up under communism. Well, so I would just, uh, if, I'm sorry, uh, I want to get more questions in as well. Um, I think on this question, this is a question of brain drain that I think you may be referring to, uh, that some Central Eastern European countries have experienced, but I don't think it's been as great as this, this would imply there's nobody left except the older generations to, to guide the countries you know, towards the right path. I think that's been much more profound in Russia um, as opposed to Central Eastern Europe, European countries, which are, are democratic, which have benefited extremely economically from EU integration. And there hasn't been as much reason to seek opportunities elsewhere. Of course, young people do, but I don't think it's as, as, as uh, much of a problem as perhaps your question implies, Brian. No, actually, that's a, that's a very good point, Alina. It allows me to say something very positive about the influence of Russia right. in Europe is that as the result of, the, of Putin's policies, some of the best and brightest Russians that's right. are leaving Russia and as a result, the kind of intellectual centers of the, where the where of, of Russian speak, the, I guess the intellectual Russian speaking centers of the world are no longer Moscow and St. Petersburg. They are Riga, That's right. uh, or Prague, or, or Tallinn, or Kiev. Um, right. it, 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 there's this very interesting trend. And the, the Russians that do emigrate to the European Union value <laughs> what, what exists here. Um, in contrast to, the, their, to, to, to their government. So this is, this is a, a positive aspect of, of, of what Putin's doing, inadvertently positive, but, it, but, but, but positive nonetheless. But I also wanted to uh, mention the, the question that Jeff thought he had answered, which we haven't talked about. It's about immigration, with an I. Uh, we haven't discussed that. We tend to think of Germany, Western European countries trying to deal with this. But, I mean, but you know, Hungary was one of the first countries to close its borders. Um, the rest of Central U Europe has actually followed uh, what Orban was originally criticized for in many ways. Um, is people's fear about uh, immigration uh, founded? Right? What, how is that leading to people supporting authoritarian populist movements? Uh, does anyone want to answer that question that Jeff already started? I mean, I think, I mean, just to take a micro example, we're even having, I grew up in Vermont and I come uh, in Rutland, Vermont. We've had a back and forth between a Rutland welcomes versus Rutland first involving 10,000 Syrian refugees coming. 
where literally two camps were created, and they're using the exact same arguments that we're hearing in Greece and elsewhere. Mm. They're a health risk. They're going to take our jobs. Um, we don't have the services. Some are founded. Like, I think there has to be a conversation about, you know, service provision and, and, and who's paying for it, how. Like, that's a legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. But I've just noticed, even in Vermont, that some of these very same conversations are being held about, um, you know, accepting refugees. So I don't know that it's even just a European um, issue. Ivan, did you want to follow up? Yeah. One year ago, before, at that time, before Slovak elections, Slovak Prime Minister organized press conference on the Slovak-Austrian border, showing the barrier, and his message was, there will be no immigrant coming to Slovakia. Many journalists, but no one immigrant. <laughs> <laughs> there was no immigrant coming from Slovakia to Slovakia from Austria, because in Slovakia, in you know, Austria, there is three times much higher salary and three times much more uh, social costs. But the point is that he spread the fear. He, with his uh, unresponsible acting, spread the fear, and at the end, he lost in, during elections, and it helped far-right extremists to rise because people who fear, who uh, basically they have a fear of unknown, uh, so they believed much more extremists that they protect them uh, versus immigrants than the prime minister. Just one example. Second point I'd like to raise. This is the issue on which is really Europe is split between the West and East. It was not the case a couple of years ago during financial crisis, we were very quite united and we, we managed that together with US and really with, with financial institutions, we, we managed that. We shouldn't forget that, that currently we have stable currencies. It's not, uh, it was not easy, but good result. Uh, during now immigra immigration crisis, uh, countries are split and I have to say, I have to give a credit to Germany because many people are saying that Germany open opened the border, but it's not the fact. They just didn't close the border. <laughs> <They just laughs> because borders were open. We are in Schengen area. It's quite different. And of course, many immigrants came to Germany because of uh, most, uh, let's say, um, most expensive social system. Right. And also because of being the best uh, country from productivity point of view, they, there is a lot of jobs at disposal. But one point I'd like to mention here is also, and, and Jeff mentioned that, the lack of responsibility. This is also part of democracy, being responsible. All the Visegrad countries so far only benefited from European integration. Since 2004, last 12 years, they just were getting European funds and they were getting a lot of money for infrastructure. And now everybody expected particularly Western Europe, they expected that now we have the problem, it's our common European problem. And everybody was so surprised that Eastern <laughs> European countries, they didn't help. And it, nobody expected that they will solve migration crisis, but they, there was a general expectation that they will be constructive and they, they will try to help somehow. So I, I have to say I'm ashamed being from mm -hmm. Central Europe that this was the position of all Central European countries and they were driven by populism, nationalism, xenophobia, and all mm -hmm. the same. And, and the same, Slovakia, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, everybody, everybody, they preferred national interest uh, before European common uh, interest. And I, I think that's the mm -hmm. fact we have to uh, take into consideration. And Tom, I, I wanted to bring you back into the conversation. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I'm tempted to say that this has been a more articulate and uh, elaborated version of what I said at the outset, but I think this conversation has reinforced some of the, the themes we started with uh, when I spoke at the top of the day about um, the, the, a tumultuous world, one that seems uh, in disorder, whether it's domestically and especially internationally, because especially the stuff you can't see directly is scarier, because all you're seeing is what you get through the media. So the fact that there's a uh, a crisis in Slovakia about all the immigrants coming when there aren't actually any immigrants coming <laughs> is, is a reminder of the way that um, uh, issues can be used and abused by politicians. I mean, in this country in the last 10 years, 
I think uh, experts and police authorities will say that crime is down from where it has been in previous decades. Uh, and yet there's a rising anxiety about disorder and, and crime in our cities and in our communities, which doesn't match up with the actual facts about criminality and, and violence and crime. So um, it's a reminder that politicians can take uh, either facts or incidents and enlarge them and exaggerate them to create a political agenda, or they can completely manufacture them. Uh, there's non-fact-based politics as well. Uh, and we're seeing that in Europe and in the United States. I mean, your, your neighbor Hungary recently had a referendum to uh, make sure that no uh, foreign refugees could be resettled in Hungary by the European Union. Well, Hungary did have a large number of, you know, as the port of entry for the European Union, uh, Hungary in the last two years had a huge number of um, refugees come through, but none of them are in Hungary today. They all walked through or took the train and kept going. So the, the referendum that was held a few days ago to ban foreign resett you know, resettlement of refugees into Hungary is to solve a problem that doesn't exist in Hungary, just like you talked about the election campaign in, in Slovakia. So I think that this is a reminder that in order to improve the chances that our children and our fellow citizens will have a fact-based approach to politics and policy making, that we need to go back to education. Um, I mean, it's bracing to be reminded that in old Europe, in Italy, and in new Europe, in Slovakia, uh, history ends with 1945. Um, if you haven't educated your high school students about what's happened in the last 65 years in Europe and the world, then you haven't educated them about anything that's relevant to their lives. And so I think civic education, basic education, is something that we have overlooked and ignored to our peril, and it's, it's what we're encountering now, which is a, a generation of people, even in a free society, in free Slovakia. They don't know what they haven't read, or they don't know what they haven't been told. And so uh, I think it may be an elevated, unrealistic expectation to expect our voters to be better informed than their education enables them to be. And so we need to get back to the basics of education about history. I mean, you can, a contemporary American history class that talks about the contested nature of citizenship, about arguments about what inclusion and equality and citizenship means, that's an interesting education that tells you that uh, there's, there's different views on equality and inclusion and citizenship and what the implications are. That's hard stuff, that's interesting stuff, but it can be taught. Kids do learn it. Uh, and adults can sometimes remember what they learned in school. So, um, not in math, but maybe in some other things. So anyway, I just wanna say uh, I really appreciated this conversation, which I think has elaborated and fleshed out uh, some important things for all of us to think about going forward, not only in our domestic system, but in uh, the way that we try to assist uh, democratic development in other lands as we think through, as we reboot for the next administration. Thank you for that intervention, Tom. We have just a few more minutes, so let me take uh, just two more questions. Please keep them brief. And I'll ask our panelists to also keep their responses brief. Sir, so your question and then um, the lady in the back in the green. Yes. Um, the mic is right over there. Thanks a lot. I'm Gia Nodia from Georgia, but right now I'm a Reagan Facel Fellow in National Endowment for Democracy. So we are talking, uh, I mean, it's uh, mostly of political expressions of this illiberal turn, but it's also obvious that it's rooted in uh, uh, change of public mood or uh, break, general breakdown of liberal consensus or zeitgeist or whatever. It's of course very difficult to explain why that's happening, not only in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, but I, I, my question was, is about uh, frequently used economic argument, which Brian sort of mentioned, that and it was said that uh, Visegrad countries benefited a lot from membership of European Union, and now you see Euroscepticism rising, which is sort of counterintuitive, right? Uh, and uh, sometimes explanation is that, you know, yes, some people benefited from uh, this uh, integration processes, but some not, mm -hmm. and it, it, it and, and it's those others who are somehow voting for uh, these far-right parties, etc. But Brian mentioned, I think aptly, that it's exactly young and affluent who, uh, who uh, are leading, maybe, in a sense, uh, this uh, uh, drifting away from liberal consensus of which we are talking. So do you have any, maybe, gr greater comments, any of you on that? So uh, okay. Okay, maybe you. more uh, kind of... Social, economic, uh, 
level of these changes of public mood. So thank you for that question. Let's take one more um, from the young lady here in the green. So please introduce yourself. Please keep your questions brief. We have about two more minutes left. Okay, my name is Ingrid Korsgaard, um, and my question is really simple. We've referenced a little bit about U.S. politics and Fox News and the scariness this is kind of happening right now. What do you think uh, the next American administration should do um, for Central and Eastern Europe, and what do you think is actually a realistic outcome given our two options right now? Thank you. I think that's a really big question. Okay. Unless somebody really wants to have one specific policy, I will keep that until the last panel, because that is the focus of the last panel unless somebody really wants to comment on it. Um, uh, Brian, I know you wanted to go back to the first question. I will say one thing. I, I studied the rise of power populism uh, for many years, uh, 12 years, and it is absolutely not true that the young people are leading this. We are seeing more of them moving in that direction, but the young people are still <coughs> underrepresented in terms of who votes for the far right. So they're still more pro-European than the older generation. I think that's important for us to put out there and keep in mind. It is not the young people who are driving this. Uh, Brian. Yeah, no, Gia, thanks for that question. I mean, I, and that said, though, I, I, it is noticeable that's right. that there is a surprising amount of the young and affluent who are, are, are moving in this direction. And my answer to why that's taking place, I think, is that simply that the European Union is a victim of its own success. I mean, you look to, to, to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, which all of us have probably at one point in our, in our studies uh, took, took a look at, is when, you're, when your base needs are taken care of, you, you, you seek higher things. So you're, you're, you're seeing this take place with, with, with the They're taking the gains that, that they got out of the European Union for granted, for granted. And I think even in, in what I've noticed in, in, in the Czech Republic, and I, I assume this would be the case as well in Slovakia, is that the generation that, that remembers communism clearly does values what it has now, and you tend to not see the, the the desire to go to something else. But the younger generation, which knows nothing except the stability and prosperity that existed in the in the period of being a member of, of, of the European Union, and I would also, in, along those lines, contrast that and to recall the Euromaidan, and recall the flag that people died under. It was the European flag. And in this sense, Ukrainians were willing to die for something that Czechs and Slovaks and Poles and elsewhere are taking for granted now. Mm -hmm. um, and that should say something about um, the value of that. Very briefly on the second question, I, I, I think it's appropriate to say this in the Atlantic Council, what I would like to see the next administration do is strengthen the transatlantic bond because the transatlantic bond has suffered over two, two administrations for very different reasons. Uh, it's been neglected. Um, it's kind of like both the Americans and the Europeans, it's, we, we're like spouses that have taken each other for <laughs> granted. And before you know it, your marriage is in trouble, and I think this, this marriage needs to be renewed. So that, that's, that's what I want to see the next, the next administration do. Thank you, Brian. And Yvonne, very briefly, and then I'll give Maria and Jeff you know, a 20-second response. Thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, I've been to Georgia months ago, and I was pleased to, be, to see many, many European flags there. And also, this is the case in Ukraine, where I go very often, at every institution. So the point is that we have more pro-European mood sometimes outside EU than inside. So that's positive that still many countries in Eastern Europe which are not member of EU yet, they see EU as really the objective to step in. And just to the uh, US administration very shortly, I'd like to see really common EU or US EU, not only defense, but also economical strategy. Yeah. And Maria? I mean, I would just say on that point, bringing the conversation of democracy and making it more of a central focus of U.S. foreign policy yeah. um, would be a great starting point at all levels, starting with the National Security Council, um, and then you know, devising uh, policy programs in support of democracy and linking it to other issues. And I would just say, too, on the youth issue, I think the important point here is that youth are organizing in different decentralized, non-hierarchical ways, and I think the challenge um, for us um, policy-wise programmatically is to find ways to engage youth in these ways. Right. Um, they're going they're, they're, they're the most critical actors, and, but embracing them where they are and understanding why they're organizing outside of traditional structures and institutions yeah. which they no longer trust, embracing that and finding ways to support them, engage them, I think is part of the solution. Absolutely. Jeff? Two bullets. Uh, number one, I think one has the feeling in the last decade and a half that democracy and free enterprise are not winning. I think that's a terrible has a terrible contagious effect. People need to feel and see that they're on a winning side, locally, nationally, internationally. Second bullet, last bullet is 
in, to pick up the one thread of your skepticism, um, I think a growing number of people want to see uh, some uh, power transferred from Brussels back to national capitals. Not just because it's more efficient, arguably, but the one thing that we haven't talked about today is identity and the emotional attachment that normal, healthy people have to their country, their community, their democracy. That's a very good point to close on that I hope we'll pick up in some of our other panels. So we're going to take a quick 10 minute break where we convene here at 11 for our panel on media freedom. But before we go, I'd like to uh, have you join me in thanking our distinguished panelists for this really fascinating conversation. Thank you so much.